A very good evening to everybody. I am here today to talk on the evidence based aspects of androgen and androgen modulating agents in poor responders. We all know that poor responders contribute to a significant bulk in infertility clinics compromising about uh, 9 to 24%. And despite various strategies, as has been explained by the previous speakers, we still haven't reached the mark of satisfaction in treatment strategies. So given in the case that despite all these, still we are not able to achieve clinical pregnancies on par with the normal responders, what else can we do? Should we improve the quality of the egg, the main key ingredient, or should we improve the numbers? There's evidence for both. By improving the egg quality, obviously there will be an improvement in the embryo quality and also studies say that even with the retrieval of one extra mature oocyte, the clinical pregnancy rate increases by 7%. So therefore, this comes to a topic of androgens, DHEA and what all does it do to the egg quality. Why is androgen so important? They play an important role in the reproductive physiology. They have a role in the follicular steroid biosynthesis. They are produced by the theca cells and serves as a substrate for estrogen biosynthesis. Their expression has been identified in the human follicles. They exert a direct autocrine and a paracrine effect regulating the follicular function. And they upregulate the FSH receptors augmenting the action of granulosa cells and augmenting the action of FSH in the granulosa cells. Since everything is about evidence based for today, I'll give you an evidence for this also. In the Journal of uh, Reproductive Biology and Endocrinology published in 2011, which is a review of 116 studies based on the role of androgens, finally the, they concluded saying that androgens do play a very important role. Primarily they affect the granulosa cell, exert effects via the androgen receptors through transcription regulation but also in non-genomic ways with ligand-activated androgen receptor modulating follicle stimulating hormone activity in the granulosa cells. Androgens like testosterone and DHEA appear effective in improving functional ovarian reserve in women with diminished ovarian reserve. And to substantiate this, you know, serum DHEA levels and the clinical pregnancy rate when they saw in poor responders, whenever the DHEA levels were higher, they always saw that even the clinical pregnancy rates were higher and by supplementing the androgens, the DHA levels also increased. This is a pictorial representation of the same, stating that androgens act synergistically with FSH and also upregulate the action of FSH receptors. So what is the rationale for use? Like all this we told that, you know, this is how androgens improve and therefore it is worthwhile trying them. So what should be the suggested strategies? We have the five strategies. One is pretreatment with pre testosterone, that is transdermal testosterone, pretreatment with the DHEA, addition of aromatase inhibitors, addition of recombinant LH, and addition of HCG, recombinant HCG during ovarian stimulation. I'm not going to talk about the RCTs, and today we'll discuss only about the meta analysis since it includes most of the RCTs and also some of the observational studies. Here I am to present the meta-analysis and a systematic review taken from the Human Reproduction uptake, up, uh, uh, Update of 2012 by Bosdo et al. It included 13 RCTs and it included all studies up to 2011. So when uh, the pretreatment with transdermal testosterone, the following were observed. The clinical pregnancy rate increased by 15%, the live birth rate increased by 11%, Total dose of gonadotrophins required and duration of stimulation significantly decreased and also the number of oocytes received were significantly increased. Coming to pretreatment with DHEA, there is no significant increase in any of the parameters. But it would be quite, kind of very wrong to conclude on this because in this particular RCT, in this particular study, only one RCT which consisted of 33 subjects were taken. So one can't undermine the efficacy of DHEA with just that one thing that is included in this particular meta-analysis. Aromatase inhibitors, they found that there is a significant reduction in the dosage of gonadotrophins. Otherwise, it had nothing to do with either the clinical pregnancy rate or the increase in the oocyte numbers. Recombinant LH addition, I will later on come to another meta-analysis exclusively on the recombinant LH. But as far as this particular meta-analysis is concerned, they said that there was an increase, but it did not attain statistical significance with, you know, depicting an increase of 6% in the clinical pregnancy rate. There was no difference in duration of stimulation, dosage of gonadotrophins, and retrieval of COCs. 
recombinant hcg addition that they found no effect in this except that the duration of uh, st uh, stimulation the number of days and the amount required were lesser it's not recommended another thing another review article which is the cochrane review which is by negles et al in november 2015 this is a bigger study this included 17 rcts and it included all studies up to march 2012 and the number of subject studies were 1496 the results coming out here said that the live birth rate or the ongoing pregnancy rate in women using dhea was between 15 to 26% compared to 12% in the placebo group this particular study included 8 rcts with the numbers being 878 subjects and pre treatment with testosterone gel was associated with a live birth rate or ongoing pregnancy rate of 10 to 32% in contrast to the control group which reported a live birth rate of 8%. This particular study had four RCTs and the numbers here were 345 subjects. Finally, the conclusion was that in women identified as poor responders, pretreatment with DHEA and testosterone improves the live birth rate. Overall quality of the evidence is moderate. and the authors concluded saying that well defined studies are required for definitive conclusion after this in 2016 again we have another systematic review and meta analysis which is by zhang et al okay this comes from the journal of assisted reproduction and genetics here what it included it was a much bigger study it included 21 studies and this particular study the highlight of the study was here there were more number of studies which qualified as poor responders by the bologna criteria and it also had more number of subjects and the following observations were made that there was an increase in the clinical pregnancy rate there was an increase in the live birth rate implantation implantation rate antral follicle count and also it reduces the rates of miscarriage after subgroup analysis they found that oocyte numbers and amh levels were also enhanced and the other brownies that were seen with various other observational studies with dhea were that it is associated with the reduction in the number of aneuploid embryos and it also steadily increased the follicular pool mainly in those when we were treated for more than 120 days now coming to another meta analysis this is to do mainly with the transdermal testosterone on poor responders this is published in 2014 it consists of 3 rcts having 221 subjects randomized in this particular in this particular study this meta analysis revealed that females who received the transdermal testosterone treatment prior to their ivf xc cycles had two fold increase in the live birth rate significantly more number of oocytes were retrieved significant reduction in the total dose of fsh and duration of stimulation with fsh was seen there is no difference in the cycle cancellation rates no systemic or local adverse effects were reported now you may wonder you know one says it may be it could be and then it says almost a two fold increase significant increase these are various terminologies with no clear cut clarity that could be because the last two meta analysis are after the bologna criteria and the ones before included studies and subjects which were before defining the bologna criteria that could have made a difference so anyways i think uh, it is still quite effective as a treatment strategy i will come to this one the next one this is uh, another uh, systematic review and a meta analysis supporting the role of recombinant lh in poor responders as a treatment uh, as a treatment here this is a very very impressive study it included studies from 1990 to 2011 it included 40 rcts with the numbers being more than 6000 there was no significant increase in the number of oocytes only a subgroup analysis revealed that there was a definitive increase in oocytes in young poor responders young meaning age less than 35 years there was a significant increase in the clinical pregnancy rate 30% relative increase and ongoing pregnancy rates there was a non significant increase in the live birth rate so definitely it proves to be a very useful adjunct in the management of poor responders Then coming to the use of letrozole we all know that letrozole is a third generation reversible aromatase inhibitor basically it inhibits aromati aromatization of androgen to estrogen again increases the androgen in the micro environment of the ovary thereby promotes the follicular growth eight studies are available inconsistent results among the eight studies quoted only two are rcts 
and the overall conclusion in all the studies says that it significantly reduces the dosage of gonadotropins and duration of stimulation with comparable oocytes and pregnancy rates. But it is not applicable to us as it has been banned in our country. Then coming to the role of recombinant uh, HCG in, the, uh, uh, in using, using them in the mid follicular phase in microdose cycles in poor responders. Basically the thought process came that the highly purified HMG that is the Menopure, it contained 10 units of recombinant HCG for every 75 international units of FSH. Therefore they thought that since the, the ANTAC trial with uh, Menopure was very successful, they thought that by addition of the recombinant HCG, there could be some sort of an improvement. This was an RCT which included 145 subjects and there were three groups here. The first group received only recombinant FSH, the second group received recombinant FSH and recombinant LH and the third group it received recombinant FSH along with 200 international units of uh, recombinant HCG given from day 6 onwards. But they found that they, they did not find any difference in any parameter with relation to the clinical pregnancy rates or the oocyte yield or any of them. And this particular study did not even report a reduction in the use of gonadotropin dosage. So therefore, where are we at the end of all this? Meta-analysis are there, studies are there, observational studies are there. Do we all practice only on the basis of meta-analysis? I don't think so. You know, this is a picture of a parachute. And uh, there is this very thing, you know, it says that evidence-based pride and an observational prejudice. All of us know that, you know, if you have to fall from a height, when you use a parachute, mostly you're safe. Of course, there can be accidents even with the use of a parachute. But what is going to happen if someone just jumps into air from a height? 100% mortality. Do we need an RCT to justify this always? Not really. So I don't think that one must undermine the importance of observational studies. It is on the basis of observational studies that the RCTs have been developed. We have made observations. Initially, the DHEA had very encouraging results and then there was confusions. Now some people say no, some people say yes. But I still think that most of us still use it in our regular practice for poor responders. At least most of us do use it. So observational studies are still important. Based on these observations only, you know, we identify that, okay, this leads to this. And then to define as to how best to improvise this, we do a good study, a randomized control trial studies. And this is how the meta-analysis are actually coming out. So therefore, I don't think one must ever undermine the importance of these observational studies. Just like what I said that, you know, it is that... It, it, everything cannot be evidence-based and reproductive medicine is still an evolving field. And a very, very famous scientist has once said that evolution is a chaos and a discussion which comes back with feedback and further improvisation in techniques. So therefore, these controversies have to exist, more number of studies have to come, we just have to get into the right path. And also, at the same time, everything cannot be evidence-based and still sometimes even the observational studies do have to be given equal importance. So despite the fact that whether DHA is a hope or a hype, how many of you still use DHA in poor responders? I do. Thank you.